Thank you very much. Um, okay, so today we're going to focus uh, on proving some, some basic regularity theorems for, for Yang Mills and actually general connections to a certain extent. Um, it's sort of worth beginning by pointing out that most of the techniques from today are pretty general. I mean, the same basic idea happens in Einstein manifolds or nonlinear harmonic maps or whatever, right? So some of the nuances are a little different, but the basic morals kind of remain steady throughout. So it is sort of nice to pick one and kind of go through it. Um, as, as far as today and is concerned, I'm going to only care about the simplest case where I'm staring at my, my, my vector bundle is just the trivial RK bundle over R. Right, so I'm equipping all that with the standard trivial information, right? So if this has the standard flat metric, uh, um, our, our, our bundle E itself comes uh, equipped with a nice fiber metric that's just standard inner product in RK, so forth and so on, right? Everything's nice and trivial this way. Um, t tackling the general case of manifolds with, with fibers actually is basically just technical mess. I like there's no moral difference between them, assuming you're on a nice C1 manifold or something like that. So let's say C2 manifold. Um, so, so it just makes our life easier to focus on this and not worry about technical details. Um, so, so, so first question, um, uh, how do we study regularity in this case? So, so, so as we sort of discussed before, the regularity of a connection depends on a gauge. It depends on what coordinate chart you write it in. So, so, so what coordinate chart do we want to write things in? Um, is there actual coordinate charts that, 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 that are better than others? And from a regularity point of view, is there a best coordinate chart? And in some sense, the, the answer is yes, and that this is called a Coulomb gauge. Um, and it's actually pretty easy to write down what this is. So, so we say some connection. Nabla, which in some local coordinates is D plus A, which remember we can right like this, so that's 1 through n, 1 through k, 1 through k, uh, is in Coulomb gauge. Uh, if the divergence of a is 0. Right, so here this is just partial, partial i derivative summing over i's. Right, so so if it's diversion to zero, we say it's in Coulomb gauge. That easy. Um, so 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 a couple points that, that that you kind of want to take note of right away. I mean, this is a gauge condition, right? So so what that means is that you know, in particular, uh, uh, even if uh, Nabla A happened to be, uh, and so so even if Nabla is Coulomb or in Coulomb gauge, if I were to pick a, a general coordinate transformation or gauge transformation. T, which remember was just some, in this case, smooth function on Rn with values in the k by k matrices, right? Viewed for each point here as being a linear map from Rk to Rk. This guy is not Coulomb. Right, so, so Coulomb, is, uh, being, being a Coulomb gauge, this diversion condition, is something that d does depend on coordinates. If you go changing your coordinate chart, you, you, you mess it up. And conversely, and more importantly from our point of view, it's perfectly conceivable that you start with, with, with a connection that is not Coulomb, but you can find a gauge to make it Coulomb. Um, if that wasn't possible, this would also kind of be a silly condition. Right? So, so the, the, the two real questions we want to address here are, are do Coulomb gauges exist, and why is this actually a useful condition? Right? Why, why, why is regularity better in here? So, so in terms of existence of Coulomb gauges, well, we're going to discuss this in sort of two parts. Uh, um, there's going to be sort of a, a, a weak existence and a strong existence type, type of result going on for the regularity theory. The, 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 the weak one, I'm going to kind of just sketch the proof kind of vaguely. Um, it's a great proof. I'd like to do it, but basically that would be the rest of my lecture. And it's kind of more on the trivial side from you know, a global perspective type of thing. Um, <clears throat> so, so let's just start with a statement here. So let's start with a simple existence. So theorem... You might call this a weak epsilon regularity. Weak in the sense that it, it makes a pretty strong assumption um, to actually get to the, 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 the existence of the Coulomb gauge. Um, <clears throat> we'll see it's not that bad, though. Uh, but it does actually hold for any connection. I don't really need 
anything else about this thing going on. So let, let's let uh, NABLA uh, be a metric connection. on uh, our, our E from up here. And I'm going to probably uh, always just assume I'm on the ball of radius 2, actually, because everything here is local, and I don't want to start making global assumptions about things. So we've got our, our nice connection. Um, then there exists an epsilon. Depending on just just, uh, I mean the, the dimension of the fiber and the uh, the dimension of the base space, right? Really nothing, uh, as far as this is going on, such that uh, if the curvature of this connection, so over the ball whole ball of radius two, if the curvature is less than epsilon, right? So note that this is a nice um, coordinate free expression here. That's what's nice about this, right? The norm of the curvature doesn't depend. Uh, on what, what gauge I stick myself in as long as it's an orthonormal gauge. Uh, it doesn't even matter if it's a metric connection. This is a well-defined thing. So, so if the, the, the super, the curvature is small, which is a gauge, which is a coordinate independent statement, uh, then there exists this was D plus A as I wrote it. Then there exists A, 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 A gauge transformation, T. So let's write this now as a zero form on Rn. I'm just going to keep writing it every possible way so we can get used to all the various notations. And so that's the same as that. <clears throat> um, such that uh, on, so anyway, there exists T on, sorry, not on Rn, obviously. On the ball of radius one, a ball of half the radius, right? Not on all of the ball of radius two, maybe, but you know, this is the usual, you know, elliptic regularity business, right? If you have an assumption on some ball, you get half the ball, you actually get conditions, right? So on a ball of radius one, there exists a gauge, uh, such that the pullback metric, which is defined to be T plus A tilde, satisfies the following. So one, the the a tilde is Coulomb. So the divergence is zero. So this thing actually exists. And two, another nice condition you can stick in here, and we'll be using it frequently, is that under these conditions, you can also, in fact, insist that this thing be pretty small. Right, so so the soup. So in these coordinates, right, our connection is very small. Um, I'm going to fix some notion of small. 10 to the minus 10 in. Basically, uh, for if you're an analyst out there, this is meant to be small enough to kill covering numbers when, when, you, when you do estimates later down the road. All that really matters for us is I fix some small thing. No surprise, I can make this as small as I want if I make that epsilon smaller, right? I'm just fixing something small. I could say one, but I like small things. Okay? So, so if the curvature is small, then, then in fact, there is a Coulomb gauge uh, on the ball. And when you stick yourself in this Coulomb gauge, uh, your, 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 your connection itself is small. Right, so, so intuitively what you should be thinking, right, is that if the curvature is small, this is saying that you're close to a flat connection. A flat connection, recall, was one for which A could be taken to be zero. Right, this is like a quantitative version of that, right? You're saying that if the, the curvature is small, you can actually pick a gauge so that A is small, and even better, you can do it in the process so that it's divergence finishes, which we'll see is useful. Okay. So, Oh, it's, it's probably actually worth observing, actually. So in this context here, uh, you could actually take T. Um, so note. can take T, actually. So that uh, at each point X, the linear mapping you get here is an isometry. So that is to say, it's an element of, it's OK. If you should so choose. Okay, 
So, so essentially, the proof of this is by an inverse function there. Um, it's a fantastic exercise. Doing it carefully takes a little bit of work. I'm going to outline the basic steps involved, right? And, and, and you know, it'll be sketchy. But either I'm sketchy on this or I'm sketchy on other things. I got to pick something. Um, so, rough proof. So, 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 step one. So, the first step here is to pick some reasonable coordinate chart, uh, even if it's not a Coulomb one. In some sense, let's pick, uh, let's try to find in a semi-natural way a coordinate chart that will satisfy this, maybe even better than this. Uh, um, and for which A is again kind of small in some sense, but maybe it's not quite Coulomb gauge yet. It's some, somehow infinitesimally Coulomb gauge, but maybe not quite. Um, so this you can do very explicitly. These are called exponential coordinates. So let, let, let's put A in a good gauge, even if it's not that good, um, through exponential coordinates. So let me describe how that works. So the way this works is the following, where we're going to take our, our, we've got our ball of radius you know, two, whatever. Uh, we have the origin here. Um, at the origin, let, let's fix some orthonormal basis. Just say the standard one we're already staring at, right? So, so let's let you know, E1 of 0 through EK of 0 be some fixed orthonormal basis, the element of 0 cross RK which is you know, the zero fiber above E, some orthonormal basis. Say the standard one we're already in, doesn't matter. Then what I want to do is take this basis here, so, so kind of doing this kind of being like that to some extent, right? And I, and I want to extend it to some random point out here in a natural way, right? So, so you know, a choice of coordinates is really the same as a choice of basis. Around, So I'm trying to build some basis on this thing that I'm hoping will, will be geometrically more compatible to, to A than just some random basis. So, so what you do is parallel translate this basis out, right? So for each V in Rn, so here's our V, uh, like gamma V of T, be just T times V. Right? So it's the straight line going in that direction, right? I could even assume this is say on the sphere. I don't really care. I just want to point in some direction. The point being is that every point here is hit by a unique such 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 line, right? So I'm just moving along these rays. So let's let's extend the i of x by the condition. As a section, right? So these these are all sections uh, uh, of uh, of our vector bundle. You can end up e gamma dot v of gamma v of t is zero for every t. Right. So so if you write out what this is, right? This is basically just saying that d d t of e a plus a i ddt v e v equals zero, right? It's an ODE. You can solve it, right? So solutions exist. You can solve it. You 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 extend out. You're you're starting with an orthonormal basis here. You've extended out to an orthonormal basis here. Done. So we call these exponential coordinates. If you look up Yost or something, these are the first coordinates they'll usually teach you. Now, one interesting point about them, right, is that at the origin, the covariant derivative of the i's all vanish. Because by assumption, they always vanish at every point in the direction of the ray coming out. And here, that means every direction, right? And a great exercise. Uh, this is a semi-exercise. 
you really need to read Yost to do this. And so this is unfair. So, so if you continue thinking about these things, this is a good exercise to do. This is why it's not on your actual list. Um, you can show the following, right? So you can show a of 0 in these coordinates equals 0. So if you write in these coordinates, let's write this as being exponential, right? So if you write the connection in these coordinates at 0, it's 0. That's basically this statement right here, right? It's equivalent. And the soup of your a in these coordinates is bounded by some dimensional constant times the soup of the curvature. That's more interesting, right? So, so small curvature means that you're zero here, but actually you remain small if your curvature is small. You do the exact same thing and Riemannian in geometry when, when, when you're studying exponential coordinates, right? This is the verbatim thing. So that's step one. So what have we done? We, we, we've taken our, our random connection in a random coordinate chart for which A could be huge, right? I mean, the component-wise values of it may be all over the place. And we've at least, using the fact that the curvature is small, we've at least written inside some coordinate chart for which A itself is small, if nothing else. Step two of our, our sketchy outline. So, so working with AE now, so we'll call... I think this is one of your exercises, that if we were to let t actually pull back a, right, that the exact expression for this following. So after we pull back by some gauge transformation, our, our, what our components look like is the following mess. So that may look like a mess, but what that means is that, so you know, what we're trying to solve here, right, is that the divergence of this guy, there's an E here. It's not to confuse that with uh, the E above it. So, so we want this to be zero, right? So the first thing you should ask is simply what equation is T satisfy if this is zero? That, that's the reasonable thing to ask. And this being zero implies that, well, roughly speaking, the divergence of this thing, therefore, is, so let's ignore that component. And if we get this, we get the Laplacian of t, right, plus some guys that basically depend linearly on t or a, right? So we've got some a and some t's, right? All of lower order, right? Maybe some first derivatives are involved, but no second derivatives. Now, the highest order piece is a Laplacian, which we love. And now note the following. Using the fact that that A is small, T being the identity map, right? So T, T A B equals delta A B almost solves this. So that just disappears entirely, right? Anything involving a derivative of t disappears entirely. All that's left is some stuff involving a, and a is small. So, so this may not be zero, but it's small. And what that should immediately imply to is inverse function theorem, right? right? And then that's how it goes. In fact, better than inverse function theorem, I, I hate inverse function theorem. I never understand when you can use it when you can't. Uh, Newton iteration, right? right? Just, just the proof of inverse function theorem, right? So Newton iteration. So once you have something that almost solves things, then, then, then you, you, you try to just linearize, get a linearized approximation to your solution, perturb, continue, iterate out, right? So you can believe me when I say it would take the rest of today's lecture to do this carefully, right? But, but you know, sketchily speaking. So that's it. That's, that's the standard way you build nice coordinate charts, locally speaking. So let, let's start with a corollary of this. So, so Taking this in sort of a black box now, um, <clears throat> let's now look at any metric connection. So let's let now it'll be any metric connection, not necessarily with small curvature. Uh, 
on, uh, again, as always, B2 cross RK. Then for every point in the ball of radius 1, let's say, uh, as analysts, we always drop to half the ball size. And for every radius less than, oops, not for every. For, for every point in there, there exists a radius, which is positive, but may depend on x for sure. Such that there exists a Coulomb gauge. for Nabla on the ball of radius r around x, such that in our, our Coulomb gauge, r times the, the soup over the ball of radius r of a is less than epsilon n. So, so this somehow, right, this sounded pretty restrictive, right? I'm saying if the curvature is really small, there exists a Coulomb gauge. Now I'm basically saying for every metric connection at all, Right? There exists Coulomb gauges around every point. I haven't told you how small of a ball you have to go to get to that point. But, but around every point there is, right? we can at least cover it by, by a bunch of patches, which are Coulomb gauges. Right? And, and the, the proof of this is, comes down to the following, which is an exercise. So uh, I'll switch this back up when I'm done, so I'll uncover this. So exercise. Show the following. So, so let's let... Consider the, the, the transformation, so just scaling and, and uh, dilation. Which maps the ball of radius r around x into the ball of radius 1 around 0, right? So, so I've got my ball of radius 1 here. Here's my potentially tiny little ball. All I want to do is shift it over and then rescale things up, right? and let a tilde be the pullback metric on the ball of radius 1 from this. It's actually more of a push forward. You should use, look at the opposite map and pull that back. Right, so, so this basically takes your connection on this teeny little ball. You use a microscope to actually blow it up and make it a connection on the ball of radius 1. Right, and, and now your exercise is to check the following. So check that if I were to look at the soup over the ball of radius 1 of this pullback connection, that's precisely equal to r times the soup of the original connection on the ball of radius r. Hence my r here, right? It's scale invariant. That's the word you want to use, right? Likewise, the soup over the ball of radius 2 of the curvature of the pullback guy is going to be equal to r squared times the soup of the curvature, the original curvature here. Sorry, this is a little squish. Tell me if this is hard to read. So, so what this is saying is the following, right? If I go to a small enough ball, I mean, this is some nice connection on the ball, even though we don't know what it is. The curvature is bounded by something. So, so, so once we go to a small enough ball, if we were to pull that ball back, the curvature is now super, super small, right? This is just the same thing as saying, you know, you know, locally speaking, every, every smooth thing looks like a constant or every connection looks flat if you go small enough, right? The blow up, the tangent map is trivial. So at a small enough radius, the curvature now becomes small when you dilate it out. Apply that, right? That's it. So, so this is just the scale invariant statement. And it's a nice exercise to see, see how these things scale when you, when you change ball sizes. All right, so th this is telling you this is the right scale invariant estimate. OK. So good. Now, now for a general connection, we have that there exists a, uh, a Coulomb gauge at every point of some radius, and we don't know what that radius is. In fact, in that Coulomb gauge, we even have nice bounds on the, the, on the connection itself. Um, so, so now there, there, there's two points we want to address. First off is somehow a, a better uh, um, regularity theorem. So, so the problem with this one here, in some sense, uh, is that the, the, this, insisting the soup of the curvature be small 
um, is very restrictive when we start talking about uh, uh, Yang Mills. So, so in Yang Mills, right, we're going to have an L2 bound on the curvature mean because that's just what the Yang Mills functional is. We can assume that, but we're not going to have soup bounds. Assuming a soup bound is ridiculous, it's kind of like really wiping the problem away in the first place. So, so we, what we need is a better way of understanding when, when these gauges exist um, under weaker assumptions, at least for Yang Mills, right? right? It won't be true for, this is general connection. For Yang Mills, we should be able to make weaker assumptions. Um, point number two is, well, we still haven't answered the question of so what? So, so, so let's try to see um, why we care about Coulomb gauges and why the condition of being divergence free is actually practical. Right? It's actually very easy to see. So the theorem is the following. So recall what the goal here of, of picking a good gauge is. Right? Bounds on the curvature are independent of gauge. Great. Um, what we would like is to turn bounds on the curvature into bounds on, on the connection itself. We've kind of done that to first order here. We'd like to see how, how to do that to higher orders, how to get higher order derivatives on the gauge as well. And we want to see that basically comes for free in a Coulomb gauge. Theorem, let nebula A equal D plus A satisfy the Coulomb condition and the bound, so satisfy divergence of A is zero, and the soup, say, over the ball of radius two of A is less than some epsilon n. I always keep doubling and halfing, doubling and halfing, and, you know, at some point you've got to figure out how many times I'm doubled by the end, but minor stuff. Uh, <clears throat> then the following holds. Uh, then for every k, there exists. So remember how the curvature is supposed to be. It's supposed to be like the derivative of a. That was our moral. So we should expect, if, if it was a perfect world, that you know bounds in the curvature give, give c1 bounds in a. Bounds in the covariant derivative of the curvature give c2 bounds in a, and so forth and so on. Being an elliptic system, you always lose a little bit and go down to go down to some holder bound, right? But there exists. So for every k and alpha less than one, uh, there exists some c k alpha. Well, maybe I should make this l. I already have a k, don't I? Which depends on n and k, and obviously l and alpha, such that the following holds, such that if we take A, and if we look at its uh, CK alpha bound on the ball of radius 1, right? if you don't like holder norms, ignore this. Right, right? It, it, I mean, in particular, you have a bound on the K, and that is very useful in our applications. right? So it's just saying the K derivative of A is what this thing is, plus if you want a little bit more. Again, L on the by CL alpha times... Well, we should require one less derivative over here. So the curvature, or if you want, I'm going to write it like this. The L, L curvature of F. So C0 on the, the ball of radius 2. I've actually stated this in a non-optimal way. I'm doing that on purpose, because what I want you to sort of be familiar with here is the following. Hold their norms, right? right? So it's a subtle point for, for people familiar with So hold the norms. Um, kind of depend on a gauge. They depend. I mean, this does not bounds on this is gauge independent. So I like using this. I don't like using condition. I don't want to bound things in a gauge by things that depend on a gauge. This doesn't depend on a gauge, right? Right. I mean, whatever coordinate chart I'm in, this makes sense. It's the elf derivative of f, and just looking at its its norm bound. Okay, so that's it. So so we can bound a by by this. So in other words, right, if this, this, this happened to be a, a, you know, the curvature happens to be smooth with, all, with bounds and all of its derivatives, automatically in this gauge, without changing gauge again, A is smooth with bounds on all of its derivatives. All right, that, that, that's what we get out of this. Poof. Uh, yeah. Roughly. So, so, 
the main thing I want to do here is understand where the Coulomb gauge comes from. So, so let's recall that F is dA plus the bracket of A with itself. Maybe a half depending on your normalization here, but that doesn't matter so much. Um, <clears throat> so, so in other words, I, I don't want to write F in terms of A, I want to write A in terms of F, actually. So, so what we're going to do there here is say that, well, dA is equal to F plus something that's just quadratic in A. Don't really care what that is, right? It's a quadratic function of A. And this is not enough to somehow control A by F. Right? The exterior derivative of one form doesn't, uh, is not an elliptic system. But what is an elliptic system? The Hodge differential. So if you add on to this the fact that d star a, which is the divergence of a, is equal to zero. d plus d star is an elliptic system. If you have control on this side, you get control on this side, being elliptic, right? That's what divergence free gives. It completes the elliptic system, right? right? The curvature equation is like half an elliptic system, and we need the other half by, by choosing good coordinates, right? And that should be the case because we, of course, can pick bad coordinates to make a look awful. So we know that, and we, we know the coordinate choice has to come into play somewhere, and, and it comes into play by completing the elliptic system. Okay, but this elliptic system. So as a black box, let me just sort of say what elliptic systems satisfy, right? Thus, so if we have some form. Just divergence. It's always divergence, actually. A view equals v. Then, for every k in alpha, right? This is standard elliptic theory, right? There you go. L. My notes say k, so I'm automatically transferring to k. Uh, for every l in alpha, there, there exists some cl alpha such that u and uh, CL plus 1 alpha is bounded by CL alpha times V in CL alpha, which if I want to just be cheap about it, I can, dro I can uh, uh, drop this and make this a, a plus 1 here, right? So, let's make this readable. And now, that's basically it. Right? So, so what we have now is that A satisfies, and all, so, so U here is just A, obviously, in our application. Uh, our V here is basically just F plus Q of AA. Now, now we also see why it was so important that in, in, in our Coulomb gauge, we have this. Right? If we don't have this, we don't have a starting point. It's, it's still bad, actually. But what we know now is that if the curvature is bound, let me just worry about the, 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 uh, the, the, the L equals zero statement here, and you bootstrap up for the rest. So for L equals zero, what do you do? Well, there you care about a soup bound on F. So now, if you have a soup bound on F, and you know you have a soup bound on A, you therefore have a soup bound on your V here. And therefore, you have a C0 alpha bound on your U. Right? And now you, now you can play a game and keep doing this with, with higher Ls. So, so even Coulomb gauge wasn't enough. It was Coulomb gauge plus some basic estimate that, that we could use to get to higher estimates. This has a good moral to keep in mind. Uh, for Riemannian manifolds, harmonic radius is what takes the place of Coulomb gauge. It's verbatim. I mean, it really doesn't change anything. Okay, so remember, so, yeah, exactly. This is on Rn, or at least the ball of radius 2 on, of Rn cross Rk. So K is the dimension of the fiber of that. So it just depends on the dimension of, of the vector bundle and the dimension of the base space.
Okay. Okay. So, let me sort of play this game one more time so we can just sort of see this again. Uh, um, so, so this once again is about a general connection. All right, this sort of just general theory about taking a random connection and trying to write it as good as we can, um, which you know might be really good and it might be really bad. We don't know, but this is as good as we're going to get, whatever it is. Um, now for a Yang Mills connection, we might hope for a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> namely, so so you know the, the the moral of these things is the following, right? So for a harmonic function, right? Well, once you have an L2 bound or you have a C0 bound or whatever you want, you, you have smooth bounds, right? It's not true for Yang Mills, but if you're on a co coordinate system where you have, say, a nice Coulomb gauge, it should be true, right? Nonlinear equations essentially should become roughly linear equations once you can write them in a reasonably nice way, right? Right? So, so that's the statement to the next theorem. So it says that if we're on a ball for which there exists a nice Coulomb gauge like this, then then our Yang Mills really does behave regularity-wise like, like like a like a linear guy. So. Theorem. So let's let have a equal d plus a be a Yang Mills connection. On the ball of radius two, cross RK. Uh, such that A satisfies the Coulomb condition. And has this nice C0 bound. Uh, then Also, just as a definition, let's let big lambda, because I like to use big lambda for this, to so note the energy of the Yang Mills connection. So the integral of the curvature squared on the ball of radius two. All right, so we've got this connection on the ball of radius two. It's in a nice uh, Coulomb gauge, and we have we, we know what the energy is. I mean, it is lambda, whatever that is. All right, not small, right? Just whatever. In practice, actually, we'll only use this theorem when it's small. But, but you know, the theorem itself holds whenever. Then, as always, so for every k, there exists some constant ah, L, CL thing on n and k, and that's it, uh, such that the soup over the ball of radius one of the elf covariant derivative of the curvature. Now I'm going to normalize by squaring here because this is like a square quantity. It is less than or equal to CL times lambda. Right. So, so in particular, right, if we're in a Coulomb gauge and it's a Yang Mills connection, this is saying we're automatically smooth and we're automatically smooth for all derivatives. One could actually probably get pretty effective estimates on the CL, but I don't care. So let me just sort of, the proof is almost exactly what happens here, but let me just sort of say the, the, the added thing, since obviously we need to use the Yang-Mills condition now. Rough proof. So, so... Our, our starting point is exactly where we started before, right? Right. So, so we have that. So, so well, no, that's not where we started before. So, so let's re remember what the set of equations the Yang-Mill connection satisfies is, right? So, its set of equations is the Bianchi identity, right? So, this is a two-form. Um, th th this is the anti-symmetric part of its a-covariant derivative. And it satisfied, so this was true for all Yang Mill, uh, all connections, period. And it satisfied the, the divergence condition. 
Now, I can go to a bunch of trouble of figuring out exactly what this is, but I don't fully care. All we really care about here, right, is that if you were to compute this out, so I just want to move all the f's to this side, and all the derivatives of f to one side, and all the non-derivatives of f to another side, right? So, so this really says that df, standard d here, right? This is a nice one form in these things, is equal to something involving a and f, right? Linear in both. And d star f, divergence of f, standard divergence of f, is equal to whatever those nonlinear terms are coming up from there. Which is q of a of f. Right? Same game now, right? So, 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 I mean, it, it's, it's a little more involved, right? Because you've got to bounce back and forth between these equations and those equations, right? Every time you up the curve uh, up uh, a little bit more knowledge about this, you plug it in to get a little bit more knowledge about a, and you plug that back in to get a little bit more knowledge about f, right? And you can imagine that being a headache. But this is sort of called bootstrapping. Uh, if you haven't heard of bootstrapping, Google it. You need to know bootstrapping. <laughs> But for now, you can believe me. It's an elliptic system, right? And we have, we have our control at this point. Um, pop quiz. Maybe we'll just sort of fo focus on with this. Why couldn't I have done this argument without being in a Coulomb gauge? What am I really using here, right? I mean, I've never really used the Coulomb condition here, right? And well, what's really important somehow? I mean, even just for a first step understand, why is this not necessarily as good of an equation if I, if I don't have my Coulomb gauge? So the answer is a little subtle, right? So, so just to make sure we have an intuition. The, the basic point here is the following. Um, this is linear in F and linear in F, so I'm treating this like basically a linear equation for F, right? But, but the coefficients depend on A. A could be horrid. If we don't know something about A, well, we're, it's, a, it's a stupid linear equation. We can't use it, right? We're starting with the assumption that A is bounded. So we're at least starting with a linear equation with reasonable coefficients, bounded coefficients. That's it. That's the difference. And the whole point is if you're not in a good gauge, that's ridiculous. You can't do that. It's not just a technical point. I mean, you can't. Singularities form. Okay, so since we've used this assumption about 15 times now, where we're sort of at a point where we should make it a definition, which is what we call the regularity scale. So how does one actually study regularity of connections or yang mills connections or whatever? Um, sort of classically, people looked for, for points where, where, where like curvature was bounded or points where, where, where uh, you know, something else was bounded, but th th this tends to be not so useful. I'll kind of explain why morally in a second. Um, so, so let's just start with the definition. So for, so we've got some connection here. It doesn't actually matter what. So for x in the ball of radius 1, um, we define its regularity scale. R sub a of x. To be the largest radius, so the sup overall radius. Up to one. I don't care if you go past one. Such that, so I'm continuing here. Such that there exists uh, a, uh, a Coulomb gauge on the ball of radius 2r for our connection such that in our coordinates, in our Coulomb coordinates, such that d plus a, such that r times the soup over the ball of radius 2r, let's say, of a, is bounded by our epsilon n. So here, what we basically assume is that the regularity scale is 2, right? Those are the basic assumptions of the last two things. Our corollary, oh, hey, it's up there still. Yay. Uh, our, our corollary right up here said that the regularity scale is positive at every point. Right? That, that, that's the key point. So, so remarks, so point 1, our sub a of x is positive for every x. 
from the ball radius one, right? That was this, basically. I think that's half the radius, but that doesn't really matter. <coughs> and point number two was that if you're using mills, what you've actually just proved is now, now on a ball, uh, uh, on the regularity scale ball, you, you have bounds of all orders, right? So if Yang mills, then what this proves is that the, the soup curvature of the ball of regularity scale ball is bounded by some CL times the, the RA to the minus what? Four minus L scale invariant, check it, right? If you rescale, that's what you get from applying this times whatever the energy is. Let's square this, actually. Well, heat squaring, it's just it's the square root of the energy on the ball of radius one, even. So, so let me sort of explain this in a more, in a more mundane sort of setting real quick. Um, <clears throat> Because this is really how PDE should be taught in the beginning, but, but they aren't, at least to a certain confusion. Because in linear PDEs, it doesn't matter so much usually, so no one ever pays attention. Uh, imagine someone hands you just a real valued function on RN, right? And they declare to you that, you know, maybe it's a C1 function. They declare to you that, you know, at some point X, the, the, the gradient is bounded by 1, right? Roughly speaking, so what? I mean, this, this tells you basically nothing, because in any neighborhood of this thing, you could be having all kinds of craziness going on. You just know at some infinitesimal neighborhood that you don't fully understand, things level out to actually give you a gradient bound of 1. Instead, what if I hand you a function, say, on the ball of radius 1, the gradient's bounded by 1, right? Now you have a great deal more control on how this function's actually behaving. That's this, right? I, I don't care if the curvature's bounded. I, I don't care how things behave at a single point. Regularity only counts if you have it in a ball of definite size, right? Right. You only control your connection on what's happening if you have it in a ball of definite size. So, so the the, the main issue people have when they first look at this is that um, large regularity scale means better control, right? Right. Not small, right? Everyone thinks of pointwise bounds of wanting to be small. You want this to be big, right? I mean, this this is the largest radius for which you understand everything in that ball. So you want it to be as big as possible. It's also worth pointing out that pointwise bounds are bad for the following reason. In practice, one doesn't just consider a single connection. When you use these things in applications, you consider sequences, right? I mean, either you're completing a moduli space, or you're trying to prove something by contradiction or something like that. And a pointwise bound is wholly non-preserved in limits, right? I mean, you could have a bound at one point, but, you know, points arbitrarily close where things are going to infinity. You can't pass this to limits. This says you can pass to limits, right? right? If you have control over this guy at a point. Okay, so we can now actually state the main theorem of today. Halfway through, okay, maybe. The theorem. Let Navo be a Yang Mills connection. On, as always, I'm going to say the of radius 2 cross RK. Um, <clears throat> then there exists an epsilon, uh, depending on, again, uh, the dimension of the domain and the dimension uh, uh, of the fiber, such that If the uh, average of the curvature squared, if the, if, the, if the energy of this ball, right, is small, less than that, less than this epsilon, so just an L2 now, not pointwise, is the key point. Then the regularity scale of your connection at the origin, uh, it's actually bounded by anything as close to, to, to one as you want the way I'm writing this, uh, but I'm just, we're just going to prove it's bounded from below by some 
by some small something. It's a little easier to prove some small something than it is to prove one. Um, so we won't worry. And it makes no fundamental difference to the theorem, so we won't worry about it. So, right, for a random connection, we need the soup of the curvature to be small. Here, we need the L2 bound the curvature to be small. Let me point out why that's fundamentally better for us. It's fundamentally better because what we, I mean, the only thing we have on a connection on some big ball is a bound on its L2 norm of the curvature, right? So controlling this on small balls is the only thing that, that that's even conceivably possible and, in fact, is possible pretty easily. Um, so, so being able to actually make this statement will let us prove a regularity theory, right? So, so let's, let's make a couple of, so here's some exercises. Um, actually, the first one was uh, uh, supposed to be after this guy up here, but, but I'm going to write it now. So show that the regularity scale uh, actually is a Lipschitz function with Lipschitz norm at most one. Um, your, your basic hint for this is to not overthink. Um, so, so in particular, it's a continuous function. And I, I we'll actually use that at some point. Uh, um, so, so it is a Lipschitz function. Uh, two. <laughs> Right. Uh, using the above theorem, right, show, and this is just about scale again, but the point is I'm trying to stick the, the, the scaling numbers in your head as much as possible. Um, show if uh, we have some ball for which the curvature, so the energy of the, the scale invariant energy of that ball is less than epsilon, this epsilon here at x then the, the regularity scale at x is balanced from below by r naught times r. So all I'm really asking you to do is to check scale invariance here of this statement to that statement. Um, but but the, the point is that this is not a random scale invariance. This, this 4 right here is exactly where codimension 4 regularity comes from. Right? It's not a random 4. Right? So this is why you really want to check that. This was actually implicit inside uh, one of the other exercises I gave you. Okay. Question. Yo. Is, is this constant going to be explicit or not? I guess it's proved by contradiction or something? Uh, for the sake of finishing this in 45 minutes, I will absolutely prove it by contradiction. Yes. Um, in term, so this is the same question as the Ricci one, really, right? If you can make the, the, the constant from the, the, the standard epsilon regularity explicit, you can make that one explicit. Right, so so you know, I, I would I, I would think so, but for the same reason, Ricci flat things go kind of kind of can be made explicit, right? But you know, I've never really sat and thought about it. Okay, so to prove this theorem, there is a key tool which we have not introduced yet. Uh, um, this is, in fact, the key tool for, for understanding the, the, I mean, even much more refined regularity theory. So, you know, what we're really tackling uh, um, in this lecture, in some sense, is when and how often uh, points are going to be regular points. When, when you're going to actually have smooth points of the Yang-Mills connection, uh, we, we are completely sliding under the rug singularities um, when they occur. I mean, we're basically going to control how big they might be, but we're not talking about their structure, right? Right? Do they have to be manifolds or rectifiable or anything to this regard? Um, the, 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 the next tool somehow the key point in both this and in that sort of understanding. And, and where it comes from is the following. So as I hinted in the first lecture, right, if you're, if you're Yang-Mills, right, that means you are uh, a critical point of your energy functional. And, and we use that to derive uh, our Euler-Lagrange equations, conveniently written here. Um, and, and we got that, that, that writing right by doing what, what someone might call a target variation. So, you know, we, we, we took our connection NABLA, we, we added on epsilon times some random one form of values in the endomorphism. It's a new connection. We took a derivative in that direction. That ends up giving us some, some bunch of equations that have to be satisfied because it's a critical point, and that gives, gives us this, right? <clears throat> um, fascinatingly enough, right, if... You are a weak solution of this. If you're a smooth solution of this, you are a critical point of the Yang-Mills functional. If you are a weak solution of this, and you've got a connection which satisfies this in some weak sense, you do not need to be a critical point. Um, in essence, you are missing variations. 
there are other ways of varying connections than just adding epsilon times b onto it. Right? That, that's, the, that's the natural way that we usually think. But there are other natural ways of actually building other connections, getting families of connections. And it turns out those are legitimately different variations. And they give legitimately different information. And, and if you're a critical point, you satisfy those equations too. It's called the stationary equation. Um, in fact, that is probably for most regularity theory to this point, the most important equation. <coughs> so uh, let's sort of make our way there. <coughs> okay, so, so in essence, we're going to do the following. So we're going to consider domain variations. Most of this terminology of target and domain comes from nonlinear harmonic maps. It's not quite how you think for Yang Mills, but I'm stealing their words because it's nice to distinguish between the two. You'll see what, why, why domain kind of makes sense. So what do you do is the following. So let's let the epsilon. So always we've got some connection on the ball of radius two, whatever. Um, and let's see epsilon from the ball of radius 2 to the ball of radius 2, be some smooth family of smooth diffeomorphisms compactly supported, let's say, in the ball of radius 2. Why not? And... Uh, Recall, write all such smooth fan well, with, you know, at, at zero, it's the identity map, say, right? Um, and therefore, write any such smooth family, if I, if I looked at the, they're generated by a vector field, right? So if I looked at DD epsilon, this, I get a vector field, and the epsilon, a phi epsilon, epsilon equals zero, is the vector field X, right? So, so our, our vector field, our guy is actually being generated by, by our some vector field X which is always the case. Now, I want this guy to act on connections. Right? I want this family of diffeomorphisms to act on connections. So what I basically need to do is take the smooth family of diffeomorphisms, and I need to lift it to, to a smooth family of vector bundle isomorphisms uh, of E, our vector bundle, right? Because then I can pull the connection back. And uh, there's a handful of ways of doing this. It's possible just picking a coordinate representation and using that's enough. But since I'm not sure about that, I'm going to do a canonical way of doing it. So let's lift phi bar epsilon to a uh, family of vector bundle isomorphisms as follows. So namely, we're going to let the mapping at x, so this is going to map the fiber above x to the fiber above phi of x, right? And it's going to map it in the silliest way. That is, if you're going to pick a nice geometric way of doing it, how would you do it? You would parallel translate uh, along the line connecting them. So this is like the same as the, the, the exponential map we wrote before. It's actually possible one can get away by just picking a local coordinate representation and lifting through that. I'm actually not sure. If someone wants to do the exercise and answer that for me, I'd be curious. Um, <clears throat> so that means, right, we take some, you know, v not here. We solve d gamma dot v equals zero. And that means that it maps itself over to some the epsilon here, right? And that's our mapping from here, this fiber to this fiber. You just do that. It's a linear mapping, right? You're solving an ODE. But now, once you have such a lifting, you can do the following. Right? You can let A epsilon be a family of connections by just pulling back. A. Right? If you've got a diffeomorphism, you can pull back your, 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 your connections through your vector bundle. If you more and now if you do this right, I mean, you, you can compute what, what, what dd epsilon of the energy is. 
in particular at epsilon equals zero. And interestingly enough, this, this is a piece of information that's new and distinct. Um, and, and I'm going to sort of just leave it as an exercise to compute the following. So what you're actually equal to is This guy here is called the stress, stress energy tensor. Sometimes it's denoted Sij. So this is the norm of the curvature squared times the metric delta Ij in this case. And this guy here, you just take the curvature, uh, on which is two formal values in the endomorphisms. Curvature, two formal values in the endomorphisms. I and J are the first components of that, and you just interproct all the other components together. Right, so all that's left is a symmetric two tensor out of this. That has nothing to do with the bundle. Right, it's a symmetric two tensor on your domain. And what this here says by integrating by parts is that this is divergence free, right? So, so your stationary equation uh, says that the divergence of S, so if I integrate that by parts, this is di of Sij is zero. Okay, so that's it. That's our new equation, right? right. So the divergence of this thing vanishes. Um, again, questions would remain of, of uh, you know, why is this interesting? Who cares? How do you use it, right? Um, actually, another question that should pop in your head right now is, since, since we made all these analogies uh, uh, um, with harmonic maps on Rn, right, right, so using the Dirichlet energy for them, is there a stationary equation for them? And the answer is yes, but no one cares. Uh, um, the problem is that, you know, here in the nonlinear world, this is incredibly powerful information. In the linear world, it's much weaker than what you can get from standard Laplacian anyway, so people just ignore it. Right? So it is there, but no one ever uses it for anything. Uh, it's a two instead of a, a four in that case, but. Okay. So how do we use this? Um, there is a standard way of using this. Uh, the, the, the main use, I mean, so, so, this, so Euler-Lagrange equations, the way we usually view them is we just say, we solve some equation, and we start playing with, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, what solutions uh, of such a thing might look like. You use stationary equations sort of traditionally a little bit differently because it's not typically an elliptic situation, right? What you do instead is that you, you try to actually pick good test vector fields to plug into this and see what information they give. Now, that, that's sort of the traditional way of trying to use stationary equations. The main exception being dimension two nonlinear harmonic maps where that actually is a elliptic equation, but, but usually it's not. Um, <clears throat> so we need good test vector fields to plug into that. And, and the question would be, uh, what would our, our good test vector field look like? And the, the traditional one you always sort of pick is the following. So there are actually a few, but they're all sort of variations of this typically. Typically. So I'm going to somehow morally center ourselves at the origin here, but we can actually do this from, from any point. Let's look at the function, which is just one half the norm of x squared. So it's the distance to x squared, right? So, so in Rn, right? So this is one half the sum from. 1 to n of xi squared, right? So uh, let, let me notice, uh, this is a function now, right? Not a vector field. Um, and let's, let's notice a few interesting points about this, because we'll use this. The Laplacian of this guy is n, right? And the Hessian of this guy is g. So, so from the point of view of the Hessian, it's a pretty nice function. And now the function, the, 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 the vector field I want to plug in here is going to be the gradient of this thing. Right? So, so roughly speaking, this is like saying, you know, I, I'm at the origin and 
I'm looking at sort of a radial vector field that's whose you know length is proportional to the distance out, right? In fact, all I really want to do is apply the grain to this thing on the ball of radius r, where r is going to be arbitrary here. So, so I want a whole bunch of information out of this, this particular test function. So, so what do we know now? So the divergence of s is zero, right? So, so we know that di of f squared gij minus four f i of j times x j is going to be the gradient of this guy. And then I just wrote it here anyway, whatever. And I can integrate this over anything I want. In particular, I can integrate it over the ball of radius r, if I so choose, is 0. Right? I mean, this guy here is pointwise 0. So all I've done is multiply it by some function, integrate over some domain, certainly it's 0. What I want to do now is integrate by parts this thing off it and just start collecting terms and see what we get, right? I had this written down because I'm bound to botch this if I try to do this off my head. Okay. So if we integrate by parts, what happens? Well, I mean, there's going to be a boundary term, right? Because I'm integrating over a ball of radius r, and there's going to be some, some interior term. So let's collect those together. So, so the boundary term, ball of radius r around the origin of, let's just view this thing as a tensor real quick. This is gij minus 4 fi fj. So now what's supposed to happen? I have to apply it to this vector field here. So, so this is going to be dj one half norm of x squared. And I've got to apply it to the normal direction here, which is of course is ddr. Right? But I mean, interestingly enough, right? I mean, what is this guy? It's just r times ddr uh, on the boundary, right? So this guy here is just r times ddr itself, right? So, so I'll use that in the next line. So I'm really just applying the stress energy tensor to, to dr dr. And I have now also a, uh, an interior term, right? So, so that means I've got to look at the, the Hessian of this thing, and I've got to multiply it by this, right? So that means I've got f squared, well, that's the trace of the Hessian, it's the Laplacian of 1 half norm x squared, minus 4 times, well, if that's gij and I'm applying it to, to well, I won't even worry about that. Let's just write it out first. Fifj di dj of that guy. That's less sloppy than me trying to write it. Uh, oh, yeah, all that's equal to zero. Kind of the point. So if we fix this up a little bit, what happens? Well, over here, we just get a, so if we pull that r out, right? We get the integral over the sphere of radius r of, uh, what is this? I mean, g applied to dr dr is just 1, right? So this, this is the norm of f squared. And this here is minus 4 times, well, f applied to dr squared. Right? I apply the first component after dr, and then, then, then I'm interpolating the thing, because it's the same thing twice. And over here, what do I get? I get minus, well, that's an n, and this here is just a g, right, which is a norm of f squared, so it's a minus 4. So this is a minus n minus 4 times the integral over the ball of radius r of f squared. All in all, fairly clean. Um, seeing what a mess all this was in the beginning. So, so I'm going to collect terms in the following ways. I, I want to shove this guy to one side, and I want to collect these two terms together. We'll kind of see why. So this implies that 4 minus n times the integral of, I just put the minus sign there, squared the r. I'm doing this slowly because it's a super important computation. This is, this happens, right, right, in minimal surfaces. It happens in, uh, 
Uh, um, well, it doesn't really I mean, it happens in nonlinear harmonic maps, right? I mean, these sorts of stationary equations are pretty prevalent when you're critical points uh, of functionals. So it, it's worth doing this carefully. Oh, I want to keep that. Plus R times F squared under the ball of radius R is equal to 4 times 4R four times the integral over the boundary, the ball of radius R. <laughs> F of dr squared. Okay. Now, the interesting point here is the following. If you sort of stare at this for a few minutes, then, then, then what you notice is the following. Let, let, let's multiply uh, both sides here by, let's make sure I do this right, r to the 3 minus n. Correct. So if I multiply both sides by r to the 3 minus n, then these two terms here actually collect into one term. In particular, what you get is that those two guys you can write as being DDR of R to the 4 minus n is the integral over the ball of radius r, the norm of f squared. <coughs> and we had that's actually precisely to 4 times r to the 4 minus n again, times the integral over the sphere. Okay. Most important point, all right, uh, at least for a first lecture. Um, this has a sign, right? And this, 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 this is bigger than or equal to zero. This is telling you that, that unlike a random connection, that if your energy has some bound on a ball, then the scale invariant energy is monotone, right? It only goes up as the radius goes up, which means as the radius goes down, it only decreases. Right, that means if you have a bound on one ball, you have a bound on all smaller balls automatically for free. I did. So let, let, let's write this out a little bit more carefully because we'll use all these things. Corollary. Let Nabla, yeah. I'm going to write stationary Yang Mills now. Somebody just says Yang Mills, they probably mean stationary Yang Mills. Sometimes if you're talking to experts, they'll be annoying and distinguish between stationary and not stationary. If you say a weak Yang Mills, it means a solution of the Euler Lagrange equation. People will usually say stationary Yang Mills, it just means the critical points uh, of the Yang Mills functional. So it solves this. I'm just going to point it out for this one problem since we're explicitly using the stationary equation here. So it'll be. Stationary Yang Mills on, let's say, the ball of radius 2 cross RK, our usual. Um, then the following holds. So, 1. Uh, if uh, we define. So, so it, it's like the, the Yang Mills functional, but I'm putting a sub R here to represent that I'm looking at the energy on the ball of radius r. So if I look at the Yang-Mills energy of this thing, just on the ball of radius r around x, then uh, f sub r of x. So the of x comes from the fact that there's the origin here, but I could have done this at any point, right? I could shift any way I want, is monotone non-decreasing. Two. So, in particular, what you get from this is just a corollary of one. I'll explicitly run it later. If uh, lambda is the energy on the ball of radius two, let's say. Then, for every point in the ball of radius 1, an r less than or equal to 1, 
we have that the scale invariant energy is bounded by some, well, dimensional constant anyway, times the energy of the ball of radius 2. Uh, why dimensional constant? Because I've got to take uh, you know, the energy here, and then I've got to look at the energy of some ball of definite radius around this point, right? Which means that, you know, dimensionally, you, you, you shift it a little bit, but it's certainly bounded by whatever this is. And three, um, I won't use this, but this is somehow the key point in stratification theory. We start looking at the singular sets and wanting to understand uh, um, what they look like and what their structure is. So if... So this is monotone, right, in R. What if it's actually a constant? Right, right? What if you have two radius for which it's the same? One should expect there's actually a rigidity. I think that's one of the central themes in... So if this is that, then... In fact, uh, right, the, the, the curvature in the radial direction around x is zero um, on the annulus. Actually, if you sort of think about what this means itself, what that actually means is that if you look at the diffeomorphisms which rescale, it actually means on that annulus your, your, your connection is scale invariant. It, it's conical is the word you use. It doesn't depend on, on what, what sphere you are. It's a cone connection. It's zero symmetric if you want. Okay. So good. Monotonicity. How are our brains doing? This is going on for a little bit. So, so there's basically two things I like to do um, still. Uh, 15 minutes is actually, maybe that says 10. It's probably enough, but, but this is something you actually want to follow. So, so, so here's my offer for you. I can stop now and do this at the beginning of next time. Uh, the deal there is then, of course, we get skimpy on the advanced stuff, right? I have to cut off a bunch at the end. Or we can do it now, punch through it, and then actually have more time for, for sort of the you know, newer stuff next time. Uh, let's be dem democratic about it. Who wants to do it tomorrow? No, let me rephrase, because no one's going to raise their hand. Um, who wants to do it today? That's half. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay, well, close enough. What's that? <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So, so what I want to do now is prove the epsilon regularity theorem. But that, that's the first thing I want to do. The second thing I want to do, which I won't get through today, but, but that will only just take a couple minutes at the end, is use it to actually prove the, 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 um, the fact that you're actually smoothed away from a codimension four set. That's like five lines, actually. So, so let's prove the epsilon regularity. And, and let me restate it. I'm going to restate it in a way that's a little bit more convenient for the proof. So... Let uh, now will be Yang Mills. On ball of radius two, cross R K as always. Then uh, there exists a uh, epsilon positive such that if uh, the energy on the ball of radius 2 of this thing, let's say, is less than epsilon. Uh, then the regularity scale then on the ball of radius 1, so I'm rephrasing it a little bit here, the regularity scale is bound from below by some small constant. In fact, that's true, but I'm going to prove something weaker because this is the right way to say it in the proof, times the distance from x to the boundary of the ball of radius 1. So I want to let it degenerate as I approach the, the, the boundary of the ball of radius 1. 
So automatically, right, this implies the last theorem, right? Because at zero, that's one, right? So, so I, I get my old theorem. In fact, it actually, I mean, you know, well, never mind. Fine. But this turns out to be the convenient phrasing. I don't like this side. I feel like that blocks half of it. Okay, so how are we going to prove this? Proof. Assume not. So what would it mean if this was wrong, right? If this was not true, so if not true, um, then 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 there's a, there exists a sequence uh, of Yang Mills connections, nabla I, such that the following hold. So there's no epsilon or no R for which this is true. So so then we can find a sequence uh, of connections whose energy on the ball of radius two is actually going to zero. Uh, but uh, if we look on the ball of radius one, then if we look at the minimum of the regularity scale over the distance from, from x to the boundary. So this is the thing that's supposed to be bounded from below. But whatever that minimum is, I'll call that r bar sub i, that's also going to zero in this sequence. Right, so this can't happen if that's true, right? So, so if the, this, this fails, we can find such a sequence. And let's see what goes wrong. So what are a couple points now? So first off, let's, let's actually observe that, that this function here actually obtains the minimum at some points, right? So why? So, so we proved a couple of things. One, this is continuous. This is continuous. So the ratio is continuous. We know that this is positive everywhere in the ball of radius 1. Right, that, that was one of our results, but it's blowing up near the boundary. So if we're going to a minimum, the maximum can't be on the boundary. It's got to be somewhere inside. Right, so this actually obtains a minimum. So note, so let's let xi obtain the minimum of this, and let ri be the regularity scale. So now, I want to look at this point on this scale and redilate in my contradiction. So let's rescale the ball of radius ri, or an xi, and this is something we've been doing a lot of, to the ball of radius 1 around the origin. Right? So I just multiply by r inverse, and I shift it over by a constant. right? And let uh, a tilde i, now a tilde i. Uh, be, be, be the pullback connection from this. Um, so what are some properties of this, right? So, so these are all checkable. In like three minutes, I'm going to make it an exercise because they're really good things to check. I mean, they're very simple, but they really give you an intuition. So A, um, the regularity scale of our pullback connection at the origin is 1, right? So the fact that it was ri here and I rescale to a ball of radius 1, that actually makes it go to 1 after the rescaling. And more than that, the regularity scale at any other point in this thing is bound from below by a half, at least on the ball of radius r bar i inverse over 2. So here is where we're directly using, in some sense, the fact that that's going to zero. This ball is going to infinity, right? Well, what this is morally saying is that you know these points, relative to the regularity scale, after you rescale, the distance to the boundary of the origin to the boundary of the ball, right? There's going to infinity, right? So that somehow your regularity scale bound can only degenerate so slowly because of this, because that was the minimum point of this. It's bound from below by that everywhere else. And B. 
And we have nowhere used stationary equation yet, right? And, and here comes the main point. So for every r less than or equal to ri inverse, this is the ball we rescaled on. We have that r to the 4 minus n times the integral of the ball of radius r on the origin of our rescaled guys is bounded by some dimensional constant times epsilon i, which is going to 0. So note this is where we use Yang Mills, because our original assumption is on the ball of radius 1. For a random connection, it tells us nothing about what's happening on the ball of radius r for some random r we don't know. Right? We need to somehow connect our assumption of an energy bound on the original ball with how things are behaving on smaller balls, if we have any hope of pulling an argument like this off. And that's the connection right here. Right? Our smallness on the big ball gave a scale invariant smallness on the other balls. So in particular, right, the, 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 the energy of the ball of radius 1 is itself going to 0, or the ball of radius 10, or whatever you want here. And now we're like three lines from the proof. <laughs> but now, remember, we, we had a nice regularity theory for Yang Mills if we had lower bounds uh, on the, 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 the Coulomb gauge radius and if we have some bound on, on the energy, right? So these two conditions here, So in particular, say on the ball of radius 10, we know this energy is going to zero. And we have a strict lower bound on the, 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 the Coulomb gauge radius on every other point, the, the, the regularity scale on every other point. So the original theorems we proved for, for Yang Mills implies that actually the soup of the curvature on the ball of radius 5 must actually be going to zero. So that wasn't true on the original ball, even though the energy was small, because we didn't know this. Right? Now with this, we get to apply our theorems from the beginning of the lecture to conclude that the, the soup of the curvature is going to zero. But now what's the problem? The, the, the problem is the first thing we proved for just random connections, much less Yang-Mills, is that if this is small enough, then the regularity scale is actually bound up from below by, I guess it was, five halves. Right? So for i large enough. the regularity scale of this guy at the origin must be bigger than or equal to what half of that radius there, right? But it's actually equal to one, right? That, that's the contradiction. Okay, I'm done. Yes. The singular set goes back, goes down to codimension five in that case, not just codimension four. Yeah. And essentially, what happens is no defect measures appear, which we'll kind of discuss tomorrow. That is optimal. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can build examples with codimension five. Possibly for limits of smooth things, you can go to codimension six. That's not clear to me though. But for a random guy, it's codimension five. Thank <laughs> you.